This is lecture 11 of machine learning and Bayesian inference, and in the last lecture I had got some way through the Bayesian treatment of regression using a neural network. And that treatment comes down essentially to the evaluation of an integral. And that integral gives us the probability distribution of the thing that we're trying to predict. The, uh, the capital Y conditional on uh, a new point, a lowercase bold x, and the training data that we've seen so far. And um, there was an emphasis there on the fact that what this thing gives us is a distribution on the thing we're trying to predict, not just a single point. Um, the integral uh, was derived using quantities that are familiar from earlier lectures. Uh, and unfortunately, it turns out that it has no closed form solution. So here is the integral um, in, its, uh, in its initial and perfect form. And we need to take one of two possible approaches to actually um, getting uh, something usable here. And the first approach is to take uh, the integrand and to change it into something slightly different so that the integral does have a closed form solution, but to try and do that in such a way that we get a good approximation to the value of the integral. And the other way is to use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which I'm going to talk about, I think, a little bit later in this lecture. Uh, but just to recap um, the main uh, content of the last lecture, uh, the first thing I'd suggested was that we should take the posterior um, distribution part of this integral, or this integrand, uh, and that we should take the section in here, that's inside the e to the minus, we called this s of w, and I suggested that we should take a, a second order Taylor expansion to s of w, and we should uh, take the expansion around w map, the maximum a posteriori point, uh, and that gives us um, a first step. Uh, in changing this integrand to make it more amenable. And it does it in a way that requires us to be able to compute the maximum a posteriori point um, and also uh, a gradient and a second derivative. And I finish by just pointing out that we can do these things um, in basically all the cases of interest uh, because, well, gradients and second derivatives are bread and butter if you do any kind of optimization, and you're going to do that kind of optimization to find the maximum a posteriori point. So everyone is happy uh, so far, and we can get an approximation to the posterior distribution part of this, this integrand. And that's where I'm going to carry on from now. So this is where I finished last time, and it really just sums up uh, what I just said. Okay, um, that's, that's all the slide really says here. Now, where do we want to go next? Well, we will now need a useful integral. And uh, I mentioned this useful integral in the first lecture of the course, because its evaluation is the subject of a, of a supplementary handout that you can find on the course website. And I will uh, reiterate that I won't ask you to evaluate this integral uh, in an exam. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know how this integral is evaluated. The supplementary handout is purely uh, for your interest, um, because I think uh, the evaluation of this integral is quite fun. Um, but in any case, this is a closed form for a particular kind of integral. Um, and what we have here is the integral in an n-dimensional space of e to the minus well, something that basically looks like a quadratic, only in matrix form now. Okay, so quadratic, you're all familiar with quadratics, A ax squared plus bx plus c, and that's essentially what we have here in matrix form. Now, um, A is symmetric, and that's okay, because that's the only kind of matrix that we're going to have to be dealing with. Uh, B is a vector, 
and C is a constant, a real value constant. And this integral does have a closed form solution of the form shown. And we can see there that all we need is the determinant of A and the inverse of A. And if we have those, uh, we have a, an actual value or an actual expression for the value of this integral. And this is going to be coming useful um, on at least two occasions in, uh, in what follows. And it's generally uh, the sort of um, result uh, to be aware of, even if it's just in the sense that you know that it exists and you can go and look it up, okay? Because we're going to need it. Now, what does this integral get us? Well, let's just uh, summarize in a slightly uh, more condensed form what we had at the end of the last lecture. I'm going to make this, uh, this little change here because it lets things be written a bit more succinctly. What we have uh, from the end of the last lecture is an approximation to the posterior density of the weights. Okay, And instead of having e to the minus the actual expression, we took a Taylor expansion around W map, and that gave us this expression in here. Okay, actually I've negated it, but okay, hopefully that's easy enough to follow. As always, the z here is in order to make things uh, integrate to 1 so that it is in fact a probability density. And the first win we get from using the big integral is that we can actually work out what z is. Okay, we plug uh, the expression e to the minus all of this. We can get it in the form of this big integral here. And we can work out its value and we get the expression for z. Now I don't actually need that yet. I'll come back to it later. But um, just as a, an important aside, uh, do not underestimate how difficult it might be to work out things like z when you are doing any kind of Bayesian inference. It is quite often the case that the expressions you need in order to normalize these distributions are in themselves hard to calculate and may not have closed form solutions. Um, this is extremely common and something to be aware of if you're going to get into this kind of Bayesian inference derivation. So we have now an approximation uh, that we can write down to the posterior density of the weights, and that's part of the big integral that we're trying to evaluate. And if we make that substitution, our integral now looks like this. Now, once again, I've taken out the 1 over z, okay, because the integral is over w. z doesn't depend on w other than through a constant, which is a particular value, so we can take that out of the integral. Uh, and so we can take the 1 over z out, and this is uh, keeping in mind the idea that I've already mentioned probably a couple of times, that those constants we can just factor out and deal with later when we try and make the final result um, integrate up to 1 to make it a, a proper probability density. So, we have this, uh, this shaded box with well, the integral as it now looks, um, and unfortunately there's still no closed form solution for that integral. Okay, so we need um, to do some further trickery of the same sort. So the next step is to try and deal with this part, okay, the likelihood part of the integrand. And now what we're going to do um, is to take a linear approximation of what our neural network is actually computing. And this is also going to be taken at the maximum a posteriori point. A linear approximation here just means a Taylor expansion of uh, um, k equals 1. Okay, so we just get a constant plus a linear term. If you wind back, or let's do it, if we wind back to 
uh, the definition for the Taylor expansion in many dimensions. What we're saying is we're just taking the top the top line here. Okay. So we can do that. And we get this expression, okay, which is now a linear approximation to what our neural network is computing at its output. And once again, we only have to be able to take a first derivative um, in order to get the relevant vector g here. And that is something that, certainly for neural networks, we can do. Okay, so we can get the value for that vector. And that leads to the expression at the top of this slide. This is now an integral that we can actually do. Okay? All I've done is plugged this expression into here and rearranged. Okay? Because we have a product of two exponentials here. So we can uh, we can merge together. Um, the e to the e to the a times e to the b is e to the a plus b. Okay, um, that's easy, and we get with a bit of rearrangement the expression at the top of this slide. Now that's actually in a format that's fairly close to our big integral, and uh, it's an exercise in the uh, the problem sheet uh, for you to actually carry that part of the derivation through. Okay, so that's something to do in preparation for a supervision. Uh, I will give the slight spoiler here that this is actually quite tricky. Um, you may have to scratch your head a little bit um, in order to keep everything... Uh, uh, in order to keep track of everything that's going on when you apply the big integral to this, uh, this part of the process. Um, but remember, as you do it, that we have the proportion sign here because we're keeping anything that doesn't depend on w factored out of the integral and we deal with it later by making the final thing uh, integrate to 1 so that it's a density. Okay, so that's some, something for you to have a, a go out for a supervision and I'm going to give you the answer that you're aiming for. Okay, so hopefully that helps. And that's at the bottom of this slide. And uh, we need to look in some detail at what this answer actually means. Let's um, unpick this expression a bit. Uh, the initial and possibly most fundamental observation to make about this expression is that it has the form of a normal density. Okay? 1 over root 2 pi uh, we have a variance uh, sigma squared sub capital Y, uh, which is the variance of this density, and which I'll come back to um, in a minute because it's the, the last thing on the slide, but don't worry about that just yet. E to the minus 1 over 2 times the variance, and then the random variable Y minus its mean, all squared. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, we have that the maximum a posteriori prediction that our neural network makes at x, the thing we want the prediction for, is the mean of this density. And uh, the fact that things have turned out that way, I think, should maybe uh, make you feel good. Okay, we're not predicting a single value, but the mean of the distribution that we're predicting is the maximum a posteriori uh, prediction. What else can we say? Okay, well, the density that is being defined here depends on x, okay, which is nice because we want a prediction for x, and we can plug a prediction in here and we will get a density with a mean that is 
the prediction for the maximum a posteriori um, setting of the weights and some variance around that mean. Okay, and I'm going to come on in a moment to what the variance uh, um, actually tells you in this context. Now, the variance is this expression here. Okay, G is a gradient that we needed for part of the approximation, the one corresponding to the likelihood, and A is the second derivative matrix that we used um, taking a Taylor expansion for the posterior density part of the likelihood. And if you look back at the full definitions for those, you'll find that this value for the variance actually depends on x, the future vector that we're trying to get a prediction for. Okay, so both the mean and the variance of this density depend on what we're trying to make a prediction for. Now, we can say a little bit more about some of these things. Okay, uh, the first box here just summarizes what I've, what I've already said. The second box um, now claims that the, the variance uh, can be interpreted as a measure of certainty. Why is that? Well, firstly, um, the variance has two parts. The first part of the variance is just 1 over beta. Now, if you look back at what the definition of beta is, it is the inverse of the variance of the noise that we're using in the model of our data. Okay, so 1 over beta is just the variance of the noise in the data. And this should make you feel good, okay? Because the variance of what you're trying to predict, intuitively speaking, should be at least the variance of the noise in what you're trying to predict. Okay, so this plus something else, okay? That intuitively makes a great deal of sense. If you look at the, the something else part, okay, if you look at this part of the expression, you will find that it depends on x, the thing you're trying to get a prediction for, um, and essentially it corresponds to the width of the posterior density of the weights. Okay, so what is this telling you? Well, we are essentially um, averaging all possible predictions over all possible weight vectors, okay, weighting them according to how likely they are, that weighting being the posterior density of the weights. Let's say that density says, well, um, there are an awful lot of weight vectors that could probably have produced your training data, okay, probably a W given the data. Um, that would potentially mean that in using a whole bunch of those, the ones that are most likely, to predict a new point, you might get a whole bunch of different predictions, okay? Hence the variance that you associate it with your prediction should be high, okay? So, if the width of the posterior density of the weights is high, you would expect there to be less certainty in the prediction you're making. Okay, and that uh, gives us a component in the variance of this density that we use to do the prediction um, that could be small or large according to um, how much uncertainty we're getting in our predi prediction that follows on from the uncertainty in pinning the weight vector down on the basis of the data that we've seen. So what is this actually telling us? Well, here I've plotted um, an actual example in one dimension. Um, one dimensional weight vectors, I don't want to plot, I don't want to even try and plot this in more than one dimension because that's just going to look really confusing. Um, here I've done the usual thing. I have a faint dotted black line which is the actual function that I'm using to generate some training examples. 
Um, and as usual, I've generated some uh, x's, okay, in this case just points, one-dimensional feature vector x. And I've applied them to the function defining the dotted black line, and then I've added some noise to get these two little clouds of red training examples. And then I've trained using the Bayesian approach to regression. And what I've ended up with is shown by the blue line, which is the mean of the resulting uh, probability density. Okay. And the two red dashed lines, which are showing plus or minus two standard deviations for that density. Okay. So the blue line uh, in this diagram is essentially this guy. And the red dashed lines are directly derived from here. Okay, so you can see that the, the mean of this distribution is usable as a prediction. Okay, if I put a new value of x in, say here, and predict according to its value on the blue line, looks like I'm going to do pretty well. But the thing that has been added, which should be really clear, I hope, from this diagram, is that you can hopefully see very clearly that the uh, training examples here are in two clumps. And that where I'm wanting to make a prediction uh, close to one of these clumps, my certainty looks reasonably good. Okay, The variance is telling me that here and here um, I have reasonably good certainty in the predictions that I'm making. And it's equally obvious that once I go away from the area um, where uh, there is training data, uh, my certainty in making a prediction uh, becomes much less, okay, because the variance is increased. So if I try to make a prediction here, and I predict this value, I'm quite a good way out. My variance is actually telling me that I shouldn't be uh, too keen on making a prediction there, because I can, but with very much reduced certainty compared with uh, trying to make a prediction in other areas. Okay, so this is the real kind of the real win with the Bayesian approach. You don't just get something that says predict this value, you get something that says predict this value, and here is a measure of how certain you can be. And that measure may vary widely. Um, depending on the point that you're trying to make a new prediction for. So that is an illustration of one way of doing this. Okay, What we did there was we said, here is the integral that we know we need to evaluate in order to get essentially um, a Bayes optimal uh, solution to this uh, regression problem. Um, we can't evaluate that integral, so we're going to change the integrand um, in such a way uh, that we can evaluate the integral, and we hope that we get something sensible at the end. Well, hopefully, that diagram demonstrates that certainly for this um, rather simplified problem, uh, you get something sensible. But you can apply this to real data as well, and you can often do very well. The alternative approach that I suggested involves Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about an alternative way of addressing the fact that you can't evaluate the integral. We're generally evaluating integrals of this form. Okay, it's an expected value, and it's the expected value of some function big F of W. 
with respect to the posterior d density for W. It's just an expected value like any other. Now, the key uh, observation for this approach to the problem is that if you can generate samples that are distributed according to that posterior density, okay, you can get an approximation to this integral. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, if you have a biased coin, there's a probability that it comes up head, and there's a probability that it comes up tail. Uh, every time you flip that coin, you take a sample from the corresponding distribution. Okay. If you have a normally distributed random variable, um, then samples taken from that normal density will often be close to its mean um, and sometimes may stray away from its mean. Uh, the behavior depends on the variance. But you can sample that probability density, that normal density, multiple times and you will get a bunch of numbers. And if you take enough samples and look at uh, how they occur, you will find that you get a better and better approximation to a normal density. Okay, you've seen this in textbooks, you've seen this in lectures. Um, you take a bunch of samples from uh, a normal density and you make a histogram and you draw the histogram under the density and you find that it gives you a better and better um, approximation. Okay. I've already suggested that if you want to work out the uh, probability that a bias coin comes up head, you can treat this as an expected value. Okay, you count a 1 for each time you see a head and a 0 for each time you don't. That's the indicator function. And you take the expected value of that indicator function. And that gives you the probability that you'll have a head. Or in the experimental approach, you take samples from the distribution take flips of the coin, each one is a sample, and you do the same thing, and you end up dividing by the number of samples you take. Okay, that gives you an approximation to the expected value of the indicator function, okay, and you're getting that approximation by taking samples, namely by flipping the coin. Well, this is a general procedure, okay, and what the boxed part of this slide is telling you is that if you can take a uh, Samples, okay, w sub i for i equals 1 up to however many samples you take, in this case big N, and their distribution corresponds to the posterior distribution of the weights. Then you can approximate the value of the integral like this. Okay, you want the expected value of f of w, you approximate it by taking n samples from the density that uh, governs um, the appearance of w, you plug each of those samples into your function f, and you sum up and divide by the number of samples. Okay, this is an entirely general process, and it relies only on your ability to generate these wi's so that they they have this density. Now that in itself can be non-trivial. In fact, it is almost always non-trivial. Okay, you can probably find a bit of a theme developing here. Uh, it's never quite as simple as you'd hope. Um, in any case, there is, once again, in kind of the time-honored way, at least in terms of uh, my, my teaching of this course, um, a very large literature on how to generate um, vectors that have particular probability densities. Okay, how to sample particular probability densities on, on vectors. Um, and the larger the number of dimensions that you move into, the more tricky this becomes. Okay, but this is important because the approximation to i uh, can be made arbitrarily good if you're doing this in a sensible way, okay, if you're doing the sampling process in a sensible way, um, by making big N larger.
or large enough. Okay, but you need to be generating the uh, samples W sub i from the density, the posterior density on the weights, um, in a way that has the right properties. Okay, now there is a huge literature on this, and once again, I'm afraid, and I must apologize, this is all down to time, that uh, I'm just going to show you uh, the most straightforward one. The most straightforward way of doing this, and this works for an incredibly wide variety of probability densities, is called the Metropolis, or sometimes the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Now, you may, at some other point in the course, have come across the idea of a Markov chain. Markov chains are a fantastic technology. Um, the idea is that you have a system with a number of states, and you have a probability in each state of jumping to any of the others. And you apply this, so you jump from state to state, and uh, you allow the system to settle into some form of equilibrium. And if you set things up correctly, you can make this system uh, move around the states with the specified probability of being in any particular state at a given time. Uh, or, phrased slightly differently, you can set it up so that it samples from an arbitrary probability distribution on the states. Okay, You just watch the states uh, as this system jumps around, you'll get a sequence of states and they'll have a specified probability distribution. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do uh, here. Okay, so Markov chain, because that's the underlying technology, Monte Carlo, because we're computing what's generally referred to as a Monte Carlo average. But the specific way in which this algorithm does it is very straightforward. Okay, we take a sequence of W sub i's. Okay, these will be our samples that will have the density corresponding to the posterior density on the weights. And we get them by making a random walk. Okay, so we always get the i plus oneth sample from the ith sample uh, by adding uh, a randomly generated quantity to it, which itself is just a vector with a zero mean. Um, and it's spherical, okay, so it has a a covariance matrix that's some value times the identity matrix. Um, and it's typically a small covariance um, so that these steps aren't too big. Okay, uh, You will probably be able to guess that um, the size of the steps you take might actually have uh, an important part to play, and you'd be correct. Now, that sequence itself clearly doesn't have um, the probability distribution that we want. We want the posterior probability of the weights. And if we're just bimbling around, taking random steps equally likely in all directions, uh, then that's not going to happen. So the trick with the Metropolis algorithm is that we only accept some of those steps. And there are two parts to the rule. If we take a step that corresponds to an increase in the density that we're trying to sample from, then we accept that step. Um, but otherwise, we either accept it or stay where we are, and the probability that we accept the step that reduces the value of the density is just given by this ratio. Okay. So the more we reduce the value of the density in taking the step, the less likely it is that we'll accept it. Okay, but we can still accept it. Now, it's fairly easy um, to think about how this ends up working. Let's say that we have a posterior probability on the weights uh, that's fairly straightforward. 
um, and it has two peaks in it. What this is saying is essentially that we have the two peaks and let's say we start in the vicinity of one of them. What this is saying is you take random steps and as long as you go upward on that local peak uh, you're happy. Okay, you, you go with the random walk as long as it's going upwards. But if you take a step down, you sometimes accept it and you sometimes don't. Okay, so how is this going to play out? Well, intuitively speaking, because increasing uh, the value of the density always allows you to accept the step, you end up with a sequence of Ws that is going to kind of move around on the higher parts of this peak. Okay, but sometimes if you wait long enough you'll get enough of a, a sequence of decreasing um, steps, okay, steps that decrease uh, the density, that you can move to the other peak. Okay, and then you'll probably stay there for a while. Okay, but the fact that sometimes you, you can accept uh, steps that reduce your um, probability density means that uh, you can actually go out of an area of high probability within that density and move through an area of lower probability to another area of high probability. Okay, this is intuitively how to think about it. And it turns out that by using specifically these two rules, you do end up getting a sequence of samples from the density that you're interested in. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of extensions that you can make to this. If you want um, an incredibly readable introduction, which uh, is now pretty old, okay, it's 1993, uh, but it can be downloaded for free, or at least last time I looked, it could still be downloaded from Radford Neal's webpage. Um, this is this is a remarkable uh, piece of work. It's a technical report. It's essentially a review introduction to uh, how to do probabilistic inference using Markov chain, chain Monte Carlo methods. It's very readable, uh, and I recommend it highly. And it's free. Okay, so that will give you an introduction to quite a lot of other um, approaches to to this kind of problem. Um, and since then, in the nearly 30 years that have passed, um, lots of other techniques have appeared as well. Okay? This is such an important thing to be able to do, not just in Bayesian inference, but in science in general, uh, that the literature is truly vast. So that's the second uh, collection of methods, okay? I've given you one example, but there's a big collection for approximating this integral in order to do Bayesian inference. Um, but I'm not quite done yet. I've still got two further things uh, to tell you about. And the first of those is the fact that uh, we get as a side effect of some of this work um, a nice way, potentially, of choosing hyperparameters. Um, the second is uh, that we can move on to Gaussian processes and uh, do this in um, a, a way that's really quite fantastically elegant, but that's coming in a moment. So far, I've regarded the two parameters alpha and beta as being fixed. So, to remind you, beta corresponds to the noise variance in the model of the data. Okay, it's actually 1 over beta. Um, 1 over alpha is the width of the prior density that we use on the weight vectors. Okay, Just P of W on its own, no conditioning. We don't know what those are in practice. So ideally we would like to at least estimate them from the data. There is another approach, which is to integrate them out, which I may or may not talk about depending on how much time I have. 
Um, either way, there's something that we want to be able to deal with. Uh, and uh, I want to just mention uh, the fact that one approach is to try and estimate specific values of alpha and beta from the training data that we have. Now, I am at this point going to leave out the dependencies on the feature vectors in the training set and uh, the one that we, we might want to predict because uh, they just make things cluttered. So uh, I hope you can put them back in again if necessary uh, in thinking about the, the next couple of slides worth of equations. Um, but it makes things clearer, I think, um, to take them out at this point. So, the first box here is just once again our old friend the posterior density of the weights. Okay. Now I've put alpha and beta in there as parameters just to make it uh, entirely clear that they uh, are parameters. Now depending on the approach you're taking we either consider them random variables or we consider them fixed in the way that the x's are. Um, at the moment I'm considering them as being fixed. Okay, so I'm writing them in there even though I should probably have been slightly uh, clearer and written a semicolon here to make it clear that alpha and beta aren't random variables. My apologies. We can in the usual way just apply um, Bayes rule to this, okay, we flip y given we flip w given y round to get y given w and uh, that's just the usual Bayes rule. Now at this point you don't have to recall any of the actual expressions because in order to show the principle here I don't need them. Um, how does this help us? Well, it helps us because it almost has a really useful quantity in it. What are we trying to do here? We want to know good values for alpha and beta. So we might want this expression. The probability of alpha and beta given the data you've seen. Okay? The y vector. And that is something that you can get by applying Bayes' rule to the denominator of this posterior density. Okay? So, that's what we have here. Okay. So the posterior density has within it something that might be useful to us in trying to work out what these two parameters, alpha and beta, should be. The question, as always, is can we compute these things? Well, there is a standard method that takes a, a rather heavy-handed, but nonetheless useful approach to this. If we knew what the probability of alpha and beta given y was, we could just maximise over it. That would seem sensible. Uh, but we don't necessarily have an expression However, we do, hopefully, have an expression for the probability of y given alpha and beta. And if you just assume that the whatever the prior is on alpha and beta, okay, this guy here, if you just assume that that's flat and doesn't really favour particular values, you can just maximise this expression alpha and beta and use those values instead. And this is called type 2 maximum likelihood. Okay, this is one way of having a principled approach to the estimation of hyperparameters. Now, there's something that I said earlier uh, which is important here. Okay, um, what I said earlier was that one should never underestimate the difficulty potentially in computing 1 over z. Okay, this here being z. Um, 
Okay, now we're saying we want to maximize that with respect to alpha and beta, and that implies that we can actually compute it. Okay, well, earlier on I had an approximation to the posterior density of the weights, okay, because I'd made one using uh, a second order Taylor expansion, and if you go back um, in the lecture notes you'll find that for that approximation I could then use the big integral to get an actual value for z. Okay, so there are potential ways into this, um, but I don't want to really elaborate on that too much. The take-home point is that if you can get that denominator from the posterior density of the weights, then it gives you a means via type 2 maximum likelihood for computing possible values for hyperparameters. Okay? Now, just uh, as, a, as a parting thing here before I move on to talk about Gaussian processes, um, that actual quantity, the Z, if you like, is often called either the evidence or the marginal likelihood. And these are the technical terms that you will find in the literature for that quantity. The evidence, the marginal likelihood, generally appears as the denominator in the expression for a density of interest, in this case the posterior density of the weights. Um, and this turns out to be a recurring pattern. Now, one thing that we could do is take this a step further and then say, well, let's actually put priors on alpha and beta. Now, of course, once you make alpha and beta random variables, okay, which you're going to have to do if you want to put a prior on them, uh, you can then run into a situation where those priors themselves have parameters in them, uh, hyper-hyper parameters, if you like. And this leads to a concept called hierarchical Bayes. Okay, how far you want to take it, it's up to you. Um, but there's uh, this recurring pattern of the denominator in one application of Bayes' theorem uh, becoming important because it's the evidence or marginal likelihood uh, that you need uh, in order to uh, do this kind of estimation. Okay, again, I can't go into that further um, for lack of time. The important thing here is that at the level that we've analysed this so far, uh, the evidence, the marginal likelihood, can be used uh, to give you a way of estimating hyperparameters. Okay? Um, you can think of this as an alternative to cross-validation that is a, a perk that we get from the Bayesian approach to these problems. The last thing I want to talk about specifically for the subject of supervised learning is Gaussian processes. And um, I took a, a decision a little earlier on to just change the ordering slightly um, for the way in which I deal with these um, because I think it makes more sense to put it here. I hope it makes more sense to put it here. Um, so we, we're now backtracking to slide 90. I particularly like this approach um, to the material that I'm currently talking about, the idea of doing properly Bayesian inference, um, because this approach to it, uh, at least for the regression case, doesn't lead to the kind of difficulties that we've just experienced with evaluating integrals. In fact, for regression, this all works out really rather beautifully. Um, for classification, uh, we need to deal in approximations again. Um, that's a shame, uh, but I'm going to show you the regression case, uh, and, and this works very nicely. But it will take a little while to get your head around it. Um, this almost looks like magic the first time you see it. Uh, when I first saw it, it really bothered me um, because we are going to make the weights that have so far uh, corresponded to our neural network um, magically disappear. And the reason for that is that instead of thinking about taking a weight vector and using that to define the function that our neural network computes, we're going to just deal with everything 
in terms of functions. And in fact, there will not be a neural network. Uh, there will not be a linear classifier or a perceptron or any other such structure, in fact. We are just going to work entirely um, by talking about a collection of functions that is described in a very specific and clever way. Okay, So you have to put aside now um, the idea that you have this structure, this computational structure made up of simple neurons, if you like. Okay, You have to put away the idea that you've got some kind of feedforward or other structure um, made up of perceptrons with activation functions and each of these has a weight and by specifying the weights you get an actual function. Okay, We're just going to drop that and start with a particular collection of functions that we're going to uh, define in an entirely different way. Um, specifically, we're going to define them using the concept of a Gaussian process. To put that in the context that we've been talking about so far, okay, we've just looked at doing uh, Bayesian inference for regression by setting up a system that allows a weight vector to um, define a specific function. Um, then we define a posterior density on the weights. Then we describe the prediction as being an expected value taken over those uh, those weights, essentially. Okay, D uh, uh, an expected value taken with respect to that posterior density on the weights. Now, at this point, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna omit any dependency on uh, the x's, the feature vectors, because uh, uh, it, it now does just make things really cluttered. Okay, so they're still there, but um, because they're not random variables, I'm omitting them from the, the expressions involved. Okay, so the point was you have posterior density on the weights and you compute this expected value with respect to it. Um, and then also uh, you may have the evidence, okay, probability of y conditioned on uh, P, the collection of hyperparameters, um, and you could use type 2 maximum likelihood uh, to estimate what P might be. Now, we're throwing away the middleman, okay? We're going to say, let's not um, uh, take that integral with respect to weight vectors, let's just deal with functions directly. Now, I'll make a, a slightly maybe unusual um, proposal here, which is, can we think of the integral as now looking a bit like this? Okay, the likelihood part here hasn't changed, okay, other than to plug the function in directly, rather than defining it using a collection of weights. And now, rather than saying, well, let's think about the probability of a weight vector being the correct one conditional on the data. Let's talk about the probability of a function being the correct one. Okay, the one that we're trying to identify conditional on the data. Um, now this should maybe give us a uh, pause and cause for concern because now I've got a DF here. And I'm not gonna uh, try, try and um, uh, refer you back to NST Maths on that one because uh, I'm pretty sure that NST Maths won't have told you anything about how you might define an integral uh, over functions in this way. Okay, but that's a little bit. I, I, I only propose this to you as a way of thinking about it. All right, rather than define things using weights, why not just do everything directly in terms of functions? Okay, and if we take that to its obvious conclusion, we kind of end up with this concept of an integral that has this slightly odd-looking df at the end. Okay, well, it turns out that although that's one way of thinking about it, we don't actually have to do integrals of this kind, um, or at least not explicitly for the purposes of what we want to do at the moment. Okay, we can take a different uh, approach entirely. So, how do we do this? Well, what would a probability density over a function mean? 
Okay, what what is this guy here? We previously had a probability density over weights. Okay, you can sample it. You get a weight vector. Sample it. You get a different weight vector. Okay, you keep sampling. You get a bunch of weight vectors, but they have a probability density. Okay, nothing new there in any way, shape, or form. So, you can think of a probability density functions uh, in the same way. You sample it, you get a function. You sample it, again, you get a different function. Sample it a whole bunch of times, you get a whole bunch of functions, but they have a density that, that defines how they appear. Now this, it turns out, um, isn't too tricky at all in order to actually implement all to think about. On the slide here, in the uh, little graph, I have taken uh, um, essentially a probability density on some functions and taken four samples from it. Okay, I've got four different functions here. Um, they look as though they have something in common, and so they should do because they come from a common probability density. Um, but all I've done here is sampled a probability density four times, and that probability density is on functions. And uh, the functions here correspond to a Gaussian process. So this begs the question of how do we define a Gaussian process? Well, here is a definition. Let's say we have a set of random variables. Okay, this could be a big set, could be infinitely big in fact. It's a Gaussian process if any finite subset we take from it has a joint Gaussian distribution, okay? Or a joint normal density, however you want to put it. Okay, this is key, okay? Note that it is defined with respect only to finite subsets, okay? The overall collection of random variables here, if you like, is all the points that could be on our function, one function. Um, but the entire definition okay, only refers to arbitrary finite subsets of those points. Okay, so the diagram here is the same as on the previous slide. I just added um, some specific uh, points on each of the functions to it. What this is saying, because these are Gaussian processes, is that those four values, okay, the values here, 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 and here, are Gaussian distributed, okay? It's a four-dimensional Gaussian distribution with some mean and covariance, okay? Because Gaussian distributions always have a mean and a covariance. Okay? If I just took one of uh, those collections of points, this guy, I will find that that collection of points has a Gaussian distribution, okay? A one-dimensional Gaussian distribution with a mean and a variance. Okay? Similarly, if I take these guys here, they will have a Gaussian distribution with a specified mean and variance. It may not be the same mean and variance, okay? But one random variable is certainly a finite subset, and it has to conform to the definition. Okay, and here on the slide I have four random variables and they will be jointly Gaussian, four-dimensional normal distribution. Okay, hopefully that is clear. I think um, that, that is something that needs to be very, very firmly fixed in your head. Okay, if I took on the previous slide a uh, hundred points on the x-axis, sampled this Gaussian process a bunch of times and got a whole bunch of functions, uh, 
then the function values at those 100 points that I uh, decided to take would be jointly Gaussian distributed with a 100 dimensional Gaussian distribution. Okay, Any finite set of points will be Gaussian distributed. And that is the fundamental thing uh, to fix in your mind here. Okay, Now, that is actually a very good place to stop. I want you, between this lecture and the next one, to think very hard about this definition. Okay? And to try and uh, uh, overcome any sense of unease that you have um, because of the fact that I have now done away with parameters. Okay? It shouldn't be too odd. Okay? If I just showed you a sequence of four uh, weight vectors that I'd got from the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, okay? Those are samples from a posterior distribution on weights. And if I plug those four sample weight vectors into my neural network and see what function it computes, I get four functions. Okay, I would probably get something rather similar to what's in the diagram on this slide. Okay, all that's happened is I'm saying rather than define them using weights, let's just produce them directly. Okay, and the Gaussian process produces them with this specific property. Okay, and that's the thing I want to think you, you to think about.